All right, good morning once again. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Job, chapter 1. Book of Job, chapter 1. You get to Psalms, and it's right before Psalms. Psalms is kind of in the middle. Is it ever right to question God? In my daily Bible reading, I have finished the book of Job. And as you know, Job was a righteous man who ended up uh, suffering terrible loss in his life. In Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, we're going to read the first thing that Job lost, and that was his wealth. Look with me at Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And so Job basically in one day, in one moment, lost his livelihood. The second thing that Job lost that same day was his children. Look at Job 1 verses 18 and 19. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Finally, Job lost his health. Look at chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Job setting the ashes indicate his grief and his mourning. So this man, who didn't really do anything wrong, in a moment of time, lost everything. He lost his wealth. He lost his livelihood. He lost all of his children at one moment. And he lost his health. And we have a saying about being at the bottom of the barrel where Job was there. If there was a basement in the barrel, he would have been in the basement of the barrel. Now when all of this tragedy struck this righteous man named Job, Job's wife and Job's friends all gave him advice. And there's always people aplenty that want to give us advice when we're facing a difficult time. Job's wife, her advice wasn't so good. She told Job in chapter 2 verse 9 to curse God and die. Just curse God to his face and he'll kill you. Job's wife's advice was to vent his anger to God for bringing all this misery upon him. To, to shake an angry fist in, in the face of God and commit apostasy. Just willfully and deliberately walk away from God. How many times have we seen this happen? And maybe it happened to you. A tragedy befalls someone. And their response is anger toward God because He had allowed this to happen. God, I'll show you. I want nothing more to do with you because you failed me. And so this person walks away from God and they walk away from the church as if to show God, to punish God. To curse God and die. Job, in all of his suffering, 
was still able to show the folly of his wife's rash words in chapter 2, verse 10. He said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? So Job's down, and he's all the way down. And his wife gives him bad advice. And now Job's friends, his three best friends in the whole world, come and they try to give Job some wise counsel. And what they do is they basically tell Job, what in the world did you do to bring all of this on you? You must have committed some great sin, Job, or God wouldn't have allowed this to happen to you. Because their theology was this. God blesses the righteous and curses the wicked. So Job must have done something wrong. Now he's wicked. But the thing is, Job didn't do anything necessarily. And Job tells his friends, I didn't do anything. I want God to come and I, and I want Him to have a trial here. And I want to show you that I've done nothing. And Job's friends said, hey, that's nothing but pride. You better repent of that. How many times have we thought that of others who are suffering? Well, I wonder what they did. Well, they must have done something bad for God to do that to them. Like Job's friends, we often assume that only the wicked suffer and the righteous don't. So if someone you know who goes to church is suffering through something, well, they must have sinned a great sin. But you know what the reality is? Righteous people suffer all the time. And even the wicked can prosper, at least in this life for a brief time. That'll all change at the judgment. That's another sermon. Back to Job's friends. Worst of all, Job's friends claim to know all about God and how God works in this world, and they were wrong. Even Job, though, questioned God and wished he'd never been born. So, back to the main question is it ever right to question God? I mean, God is all powerful. God could certainly prevent something from happening. God can raise the dead. God can do anything. So is it ever right to question God? And the answer is, there's absolutely nothing wrong with asking God questions. You can ask God sincere questions. And there's certainly nothing wrong with coming to God with a hurting and anxious heart humbly seeking comfort from Him. So you, you should ask God questions. You should ask God questions about your faith. Read your Bible and pray and seek the answers to those questions. And certainly, you should bring your broken heart to Christ. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. I read this last week. Let me read it again. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time He may exalt you, Casting all of your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. So yes, ask God questions. Seek answers. And bring your broken heart to Christ often. But it is never right to be angry at God and accuse Him of wrongdoing on your behalf. God, you could have prevented this, but you didn't. Therefore, I am angry at you. That is never right. You see, in the Bible, lashing out at someone in anger is, is never right. It's always wrong. Now, there's such a thing as righteous indignation. Being righteously indignant because of the wickedness of the world in which we live. But to lash out in anger at another person is always wrong. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. 
Now, go back to Job's wife for a moment. Her advice to her husband's misery was to act out in anger and to curse God and die. Now, most people think that it's okay to be angry at God because He's God and He can take it. And besides, if God is all-powerful and, and He doesn't act in your behalf the way that you think you should, well, it's okay to be angry at Him. But if it's never, ever right to lash out in anger at another person, why in the world would we ever think it's right to be angry at God, accusing God of wrongdoing? It's never right to curse God. Now, when a person gets angry at God because of a perceived failure on God's part to do good in our lives or to prevent evil from happening into our lives, all up to that moment, we, we may have thought we were just fine and dandy with God. Going to church and being a Christian and praying and reading my Bible. But then, God failed me and I'm done with Him. What does that show us? It shows us that God has been on trial up to that moment. We have had God on trial, just waiting for Him to mess up. So we can accuse Him of being wrong, so that we can show Him and walk away from Him. When you follow Christ with conditions, and when Christ fails to meet those conditions that you have set for Him, you can be sure that you have had Christ on trial and you're no follower of Jesus. Because you have become His judge. And that is blasphemy. If you are angry at God, accusing Him of failing you, accusing Him of wrong, there's not a problem with God, there's a problem with you. <coughs> How can you, a sinful human being, accuse holy and righteous God of wrong? How can we, as mere mortals, even begin to question the ways of Almighty God? How can we, who can't even see into the next second, accuse God, who knows everything, of doing wrong or of not understanding my situation or not of, for caring for me enough? The problem with Job's three buddies was that they thought they knew God better than God knew Himself. And this is what happened to those guys. God did appear to Job. And this is what God said to Job's friends. Chapter 42, verse 7. The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken what is right concerning me. Wow. Job's friends' skewed theology not only mis misinterpreted the reasons for Job's suffering. Remember, according to their skewed theology, righteous people don't suffer, only the wicked. Therefore, Job must have sinned because he's suffering. Job is wicked. That theology was wrong. Job didn't do anything wrong. He wasn't sinless, but these things that came upon Job wasn't because Job had sinned. Not only were they wrong about Job's situation, but their wrong theology, and this is bad, misrepresented God. For God had allowed this suffering to come upon Job. Job hadn't sinned. This was, a, this was according to the purpose of God. He came to test Job. And God will test us. He will test our faith. Now, why does God test our faith? So that He can know that we're saved? So that He can know that we really believe what we claim to believe? No. God already knows, but you don't know. And you're the one that needs to know. It's just like prayer. You think prayer changes God? Prayer changes you. God changes you. You are the one. We are the ones that need to know 
if we really believe what we claim to believe, and there is nothing in the world like a tragedy or a crisis that will test us in the areas of our faith. If we are ever going to talk about why God does or doesn't do something, we had better be sure that we're speaking from understanding. And that understanding comes from the Word of God. And remember this, a great part of what God does in this world and in our individual lives is rooted in mystery. It's all working redemptively but it's mysterious to us. Listen to Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. It is precisely this lack of knowledge that plagued Job's friends and even Job himself. Although Job never accused God of doing wrong, nevertheless, he complained about what was happening to him, and in his complaint, it was revealed that he too misunderstood the ways of God. And so Job is confronted by God, and this is what God said to Job, chapter 38, verses 1, 2, and 3. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, this is what God said to Job, and all of Job's complaint about why, and, and, and I wish I was dead, I wish God would come and vindicate me. This is, what, this is what God said to Job. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, and I will question you and make it known to you. And then God sits Job down and says, Where were you when I created everything? Do you know how all of that works, Job? And so God questioned Job. You see, God's not on trial. Job's wife was. Job's friends were. And Job himself was on trial. But not God. And so God comes down and He questions Job. And when God is done questioning Job, did Job keep on complaining? No. He stopped complaining and he humbled himself before the Almighty, and he confessed in Job 42, the last part of verse 3, and then verse 6, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So you had all of these people who were mad at God. Job was mad at God to a certain extent. Job's wife was mad at God. I don't know if Job's friends were mad at God, but they were wrong about God, and God was mad at them. And it's never right, therefore, to be angry at God, accusing God of wrongdoing in your life. God, you could have stopped this. God, why didn't you allow me this? God, how could you take them from me? Why am I suffering with this? Why do I have cancer? Now, I'm not making light of any of this tragedy in Job's life or anybody else's life. Suffering hurts, and it brings us to despair. And there are times when God can bring us out of the muck and mire of a crisis. But so often, we go through it, and God goes through it with us. But in all of God's doings, God is not wrong. It wasn't okay for Job's wife to say to Job, you should curse God and die. It wasn't okay for Job's friends to be wrong about God and to accuse Job falsely. And it wasn't okay for Job to complain about what God had brought into his life. And remember, when God came before Job, God strongly rebu rebuked Job for the attitude he expressed to God. So why would it be okay for us to be angry at God, accusing Him of wrongdoing in our life? But we do it all the time. We have such a low, pathetic view of God. There's no fear of God in our eyes. We think we can just 
curse God and, and, and go on like it was no big deal. God, you're on trial every day in my life. Every time you fail, I'll show you. I'll quit going to church. I'll quit reading my Bible. And I'll keep praying. That'll, that'll show you. All it shows is how wrong we are. Just because we don't understand why God does what God does or why God allows what He allows doesn't mean that God has failed you. God is good and all of His ways are good. Have you forgotten Romans 8.28? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. We may not understand how this particular crisis works for my good, but at least we know that it does. What is that good, by the way? What is the good that God works through everything that we face? Well, Romans 8, 29 says, to be conformed into the image of His Son. It makes us like Jesus who suffered. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus is to walk the pathway of suffering and rejection and ridicule and persecution. You still want to be like Jesus, do you? Oh, I want to be like Jesus, but I, I don't want the suffering. I want to be like Jesus so long as God is good to me. Don't ever put God on trial. Don't give God conditions that He has to meet in order for you to be His buddy. And when God fails to meet those conditions, you're instantly angry at God and done with God. That doesn't hurt God. God's not saying, Oh, I wish they would just come back to church. Forgive me for, for not bailing them out. Such an angry response to God, accusing God of wrong in your life, betrays the attitude of a proud and stubborn heart. If you're always making your point to God and showing God when God fails you according to your definition of failure by God, it shows your heart has never been yielded to Christ. Rather, it shows a heart in rebellion against Him. And that's just the simple truth. It could just be that through all of this anger towards God, He's showing you that you need Him. And that you need to repent. And be like Job. And humble yourself. And say, I have other things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me. How can any of us ever for a moment accuse God of wrong? How can we ever say to God, you don't understand. God, you don't care about me. When God has given His Son to die for your sins, to redeem you to Himself, how can we ever shake an angry fist in the face of God when Romans 5.8 tells us that God demonstrates His own love for us in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Tell me again how much God does not care for you. And I will show you the cross. You are wrong. One more word about suffering, and I don't say this lightly, but suffering is temporary. It's not the whole story. It's not your whole story. Having cancer and dying from cancer is not your whole story. Losing a child is not your whole story. It's not the end of the story. Having difficulties in life and marriage, that's, that's not the whole story. It's temporary. These problems, these sufferings, these losses, this pain is temporary for the children of God. 
better day is coming. Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. There's a better day coming. God's, He knows what He's doing in our lives. He's taking care of us. He's provided atonement for our sins to reconcile us to Himself. And then we take a fist and say, God, how could you? How quickly we forget our Lord who saved us. God is not only making us holy through suffering, making us like Christ, He is also teaching us to lean, to trust Him. Second, we're almost done. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. And we would say, Paul, how bad was it? For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Have you ever been so low in your life that you despaired of life yourself? Job said, I wish I had never seen the sun of day. The light of day. Paul said, brothers, I want you to understand something. We were so low that we despaired of life itself. Paul, that's pretty low. It's about as low as you can get. Paul went on to say, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. People wanted to kill Paul because of Christ. Wanted to kill him. Paul was stoned and left for dead. He was shipwrecked, sick, imprisoned. Finally had his head taken from his shoulders by Rome. And this is what Paul said. But all of that, was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So the enemy comes and he takes your life. But as a Christian, you know God's got you. And God raises you back. You will be put in the earth. But God will resurrect you. Every problem that you face is gone when you're in that grave. And then at the judgment, God will raise you up. And you will live. The problems that we face, the trials that we endure, make us holy, number one, and teach us to rely on God, not ourselves. If a crisis that you're facing doesn't drive you to God, then you better re-examine your Christianity. If your whole relationship with God is based on how well He performs for you, that's not Christianity. You're the judge and He's on trial. There's only one thing I can say to any of us who are angry at God this morning, accusing Him of doing wrong in our lives, and that is to repent of your anger and flee to Christ for healing and salvation or restoration. Jesus has promised you in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, He says, Come to Me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As long as you're angry at God, accusing God of wrongdoing in your life, you are not at rest in your soul. You are a person most miserable, for you are bitter against God. The God who showed His love for you by sending Jesus to die for your sins. So that you can be reconciled to God. The God that you're angry at. So that you can live forever with God. The God that you are angry at. The God you accuse of not understanding and not caring. You need to repent of that and ask for His forgiveness. It's never right. Never right to be angry at the Almighty saying He failed you. That He's wrong. But it's always right to repent of such a sin and come quickly to Christ for forgiveness and reconciliation. It's always right to ask God to forgive you and to save you, to restore you. I dare say that there have been opportunities, will be opportunities for us to have faith in God through a trial or to be mad at God question Him. Know that God has 
fully demonstrated His care and love for you through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that everything that we face in this life, even the good, especially the difficult, is temporary. There's a better day coming for the children of God. Hang in there with your faith and hope resting exclusively on Jesus Christ. And if it is God's will to take you out of this world, He's but taking you home. If it is God's will that people persecute you for the sake of His Son, it only shows that you belong to Jesus. That God's judgment is against them. If it is God's will for us to face a very difficult time, He faces it with you. And the suffering, the pain, and the grief, and the sense of loss will pass. only for a moment. But joy comes in the morning. There's a better day for the children of God. No more death, no more dying, no more suffering, no more sinning, no more crying, no more funerals, no more war, no more COVID, no more diseases, no more cancer, no more Spousal abuse, neglect, child abuse, those things will be gone. The sun will rise on a new day. Christ will come to this earth. He will judge this wicked world, but He will raise His children up, glorify their bodies, and we will live forever with Him. That's your heritage as a Christian. Nobody no enemy of the cross, no cancer, no violent individual, no godless immorality can ever take that away. Death couldn't conquer Jesus. And because Jesus conquered death, we are conquerors with Him. Don't tell me how bad God is to you. Don't tell me how God doesn't care for you. God cares more than we could ever understand. Let's stand together. Almighty God, Father, forgive us for our anger at You. Forgive us for having You on trial in our lives. Lord, we repent in dust and ashes. And Lord, we have other things that we just don't understand. Oh, Father, forgive us. And let us come to You humbly, joyfully, thankfully. For you have redeemed us through the blood of your Son. What a price was paid to redeem sinful people unto yourself. Lord, we praise you and we glorify your name for the sacrifice of your Son who brings eternal life to guilty sinners. Give us repentance unto faith. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Hymn number 285. Oh. Take my